Hey, Slingers, welcome back to another week of the Word Slinger podcast. I'm glad you dropped by. We're going to be talking to David Gochran today. Now, this guy is into a little bit of everything. He's a uh, fiction writer, but he's also a nonfiction writer helping out the indie author community. If you haven't heard of this guy, you're not actually in the indie author community yet, but welcome. Now, we're going to hop into this interview. Stick around afterwards. I've got some industry news you're really going to dig. I'll see you on the other side with all that. And for now, enjoy this interview with David Gochran. It's the Word Slinger Podcast, where story matters. Build your brand, write your book, redefine who you are. It's all about the story here. What's yours? Now, here's the guy who invented pants optional, Kevin Tumlinson, the Word Slinger. Word Slinger. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Um, now, I'm going to start this, this entire interview with a major mea culpa. Uh, what you did not hear was the entire hour-long interview I did with David Cochran. Um, I don't know, David. It was, it was a couple of months ago, right? <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was the greatest interview of all time. It was. Yeah, yeah. All those celebrities dropping in, George Clooney, the Royals, you know. I can't believe I got out my banjo. That was, <laughs> I never do that. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Lost to history. That one is lost to history. But welcome, uh, David Gochran, for, uh, uh, you know, and thank you for uh, reappearing graciously. Uh, he's the author of Let's Get Digital, among other uh, fantastic books. He's a, uh, he's very supportive of the indie author community. Uh, and has some fantastic fiction as well. I, I, I'm loving Liberty Boys and uh, some of your other stuff, man. So welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. And just, just for everyone uh, watching and listening, the, uh, the introduction last time was actually twice as impressive. So just, just pretend I'm much more important and, and entertaining and this should go. Uh... I, 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 feel, I feel terrible. I, I, love, I love David and everything he does for the community and everything he's out there doing. Um, and uh, I, I have, this is, that's the first, that's the first of two uh, interviews that got lost in the transition to my new space. I have to apologize to Brian Meeks too <laughs> and get him back on the show. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you okay. There's so much we could talk about and there's so many things going on in the industry right now that I, I I'm so tempted to talk to you about, but then it's, we'll get off in the weeds, man. But um, what, let's just hop into the stuff you want to talk about most. <laughs> what do you got going well, on right now? Well, right now I'm just I'm launching a new a new website, um, which has been a job that has been uh, going on since probably last October on and off, which mm-hmm. had to kind of go on pause while I was writing a bunch of new books and releasing new books. But it, it's something I've been working on for ages. And uh, I'm, I, I'm, it's exciting to no one else probably except for me, but I'm very, very excited about it because it's a, it's a custom WordPress team and it's got all sorts of exciting things going on under the hood with Facebook pixel tracking and, and most importantly for me, because um, I write fiction and nonfiction and uh, the nonfiction sells more than the fiction, which means um, the nonfiction stomps all over my fiction in terms of the also bots. Yeah. So, it's, it's a recurring problem for me where I can organize a promotion for, for my historical novels and they'll sell pretty well during the promotion and then it'll just fall flat afterwards. And, yeah. and the problem with that is my also bots are, are, are polluted at this point. So one thing I, I started doing about a year ago is I, I started kind of divorcing myself because I, I'd done everything wrong from the start. So I started splitting up my mailing lists, splitting up my web presence and just building walls between my two audiences. Whereas before, I was trying to get crossover. I was trying to get people who enjoyed my writer books to check out my fiction and yeah. vice versa. And now I'm not, I'm, I'm, it's almost like I'm two, two different people. Like I, I, I have a website with, with very little links going back between the fiction side and the nonfiction side. You, you'll be doing very well to, if you go to my author website now, you'll be doing very well to even find a link over to the fiction side of the website. Like it's, it's, it's actually totally hidden which is right. the exact, exact opposite of what I used to do. You know, it's really yeah. funny, um, which is just a, a nice way of saying that I did everything wrong the first time around. Um, but you live and learn, right? <laughs> yeah, man. I, and I, I, I need to pay close attention to what you do there because, you know, I, I suffer from a, a similar problem. Um, not that my 
my nonfiction does not sell my fiction. Thank God. Uh, yeah. But you know, I have a, I have crossover in my audiences, but so, you, you know, I've, I've recently interviewed a couple of folks um, who uh, write with pen names specifically for that reason. I mean, do you think, I mean, is that something you're considering or would have considered had you, uh, if you could do it all over again? Yeah, if I could do it all over again, I would definitely um, put the nonfiction out under a slightly tweaked name, even even just an initial or something like like Ian M. Banks did. That's enough um, to distinguish it as a separate author in the eyes of the Amazon, the all powerful Amazon algorithms. Um, yeah. But yeah, like I think it's something that a lot of because a lot of authors you know, write in more than one genre. And it's not always like um, science fiction and fantasy where there might be some natural crossover. Often it is two genres which have little or no crossover. And our natural inclination as, as artists is, you know, because I, I, I think, you know, writers generally probably have a bit more eclectic taste than the average reader. Like you meet readers who will only read military science fiction um, and nothing else, or they'll only read grim, dark, epic fantasy, whatever. Um, whereas I think writers might be a bit more kind of intellectually curious of, about checking out some other stuff. So yeah. we, for, we forget that, that um, first of all, that readers are probably aren't as adventurous in their tastes as we are. But secondly, it, and this is the real problem, um, it's, it's the Amazon algorithms. Like, uh, like Amazon have built this amazing system for figuring out what readers like and then recommending them more of it. Um, and, and lots of us have built careers on the back of that where you know, we, we, we figured out a way to launch books or promote books and then Amazon system will take over and do the selling for us. And a lot of us made our names under that system. But, you know, there is another side to that where um, if Amazon system gets, doesn't get a clear read on, on what kind of book it is, uh, then it'll start recommending your book to the wrong people. And then the wrong people obviously won't buy it. And then the system will think your book isn't very popular or good and will stop recommending it to people. Yeah. Like I had a, I had a very clear um, instance of that when I launched, I think it was my second historical novel and it, it was a bit more commercial and it had an American protagonist. So I, I, I thought I'd, you know, really go for it and do an aggressive launch, launch it at 99 cents and push it to my writer crowd. Cause I, I built up a platform there um, faster than I did on the fiction side. And I figured, Hey, you know, they'll, they'll either buy it maybe because they want to support me or because they're curious to see what my writing style is like, or, or maybe because they're actually, kind of interested in historical fiction yeah and you know the launch went pretty well but then a week later all my also bots changed into writer books on my historical novels so you know i knew straight away i was in big trouble and uh i, I sold barely anything then I, I think i sold like 500 or something in the week of the launch and then the following week i sold like two or three copies and then i was selling like one a month for the next two months it was a total disaster and that was because yeah. amazon system had the wrong idea of what kind of book it is that and that's a great example of um sort of the short-term thinking rather than a long-term strategy right because yeah, yeah totally. the idea is i want to make as much money as i can off of off this uh, this book launch and so and i've got an audience over here that likes and appreciates me uh, but it may not strategically be advantage advantageous yeah, and like, you know, I think it's okay to tell people outside your target audience about a book, but only yeah. only after a while, only after like, you know, the right also bots have firmly attached themselves to your book and mm -hmm. Amazon system already has a clear idea of what kind of book it is because it, it's at its most vulnerable at the very start. And um, that's when it's, you know, it's, it's a real danger to, to expose that book to people outside your target audience. Like I, I wrote a blog post last year I had the title there, please don't buy my book. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was just about the, the natural inclination we have when, when we create something, we want to share it with the world. Um, but we really shouldn't. Like we shouldn't tell our friends and family or our colleagues about our book unless they are genuine readers of that genre. Um, mm -hmm. not, not until it, it, it's out for a little while and, and it's already found its first few readers and those also bots have attached and they're, and they're pretty stable then at that point, I think it's safe to, to tell people outside your target audience about it. Yeah, you, you know, you talk about this in, uh, you have one of the best uh, lead magnets of, of anyone out there, uh, by the way, with Amazon Decoded, um, which is free if you sign up on, is it still free on your website? It is still free, yeah. I have no plans to, uh, to change that in the, in the short term anyway. I might, I might um, 
beef it up and release a paid version at some point and then swap in something else. But I think it works. It work, it's working really well as a, as a reader magnet. So at the moment, I'll just leave it. Yeah, I'll buy it if you, uh, if you beef it up. I'll buy it. There's a lot of wisdom crammed into that. So you got at least one sale is what I'm saying. All right. <laughs> I'll fact that I didn't take calculations. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, but you talk about this very thing. Um, and, uh, and I want to talk about, you know, let's get digital, which kind of everybody, it's one of the, uh, uh, staple books, um, that everyone coming into the industry reads or should read. Uh, and then you recently released, uh, strangers to super fan, which I'm still reading. I've, 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 you know, we've got our to be read piles. I, I started reading it and I had to put it aside while I read everyone's arcs that I promised to read, but I'm, I'm reading it and it's already uh, been impactful. So what's the strategy there? You've got all these uh, author centric books. Um, I'm always curious when people do both uh, nonfiction and fiction, I, I'm walking that line myself, but I keep, I keep kind of trying to tip myself back towards fiction entirely but you clearly have a strategy. Like what's, what's the plan overall for, for both these channels? I know you're dividing them up a little more. I have absolutely no strategy. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Um, like That's when okay. I, when, I, when, I, when I released Let's Get Visible in 2013, I swore I would never write another book for writers because, you know, trying to figure out all those algorithms and everything almost broke my brain. Yeah. And uh, I was just like, never again. And I'm just going to be writing fiction full time. But I keep getting pulled back into it, you know? And like, it was after I did the second edition of Let's Get Digital, I was like, okay, definitely done now. But then, you know, a few years later, my mind starts kind of circling the ideas again. And, and, and right now I'm, I, I'm definitely gonna be, definitely gonna have at least one more book for writers. Um, probably something on BookBub ads, but possibly something on Facebook ads as well. Cause I think I've yeah. got a slightly different approach that other people aren't um, using at the moment. Um, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I think I, I found a way to kind of stealth write books because like right now, because I, I spent the last year working on nonfiction and I'm just desperate to get back to fiction. Well, actually started a new book there a few weeks ago, a pen name book, actually an, an experiment. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have to write at least three novels, I think, before I can write any more nonfiction because it, it's been too long since I've released any fiction. And that's yeah, just... that now needs to be built up again. It starts to numb your soul. Uh, when, I, when I go long stretches without doing the fiction, I, I, I get this, I start getting more and more anxious. <laughs> yeah, no, like I, I, I totally agree with that. And I think there's a danger in letting the skills get rusty too, because it's, it is a totally different skill set. Like, well, for me anyway, I find nonfiction really, really easy to write. Um, I can kind of do it in my sleep. Yeah. And I find fiction like a near impossible challenge, but I, I enjoy it much more. Maybe. Maybe because it is more challenging, I don't know. Um, but like, I think there's so many more moving parts than than in a like kind of how-to nonfiction book. Yeah. Um, so I enjoy that. I enjoy that kind of challenge. But I feel like I, I just started a new a new book, and the plotting side of it was fine. Like you know that I whizzed through that, got a fairly tight plot. But then when it came to the actual starting the writing part, then like you know I had my my writing muscles felt all flabby, and I could barely lift up the, you know the little bar on its own without without any weights on it so yeah i i i don't want to leave it too long again um you know i'd like i'd like to make fiction more the priority going forward but i i still think there's like there's enough new marketing strategies and approaches and tools and stuff where i think i'll always have something to say on the on the writer side of things yeah now you mentioned you're you're writing the something under a pin name have you written under pin names before i haven't no this this is the first time Okay, because that's the, the thing that I always wonder about, and I need to ask more um, more writers who are using pen names. I need to talk to more of these folks because the thing that always uh, got to me was uh, it seems like I'd have to start completely over with marketing. Um, and you get some advantages in that you have resources, but then you lose the advantage of the platform. Have you have you worked out a strategy for uh, for that? Well, um, in, only in part. I, I was going to worry about the writing first, and and then the marketing might 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 come along the way. But it's going to be in KU. Like everything I'm doing is wide at the moment, and everything yeah. I'm building towards is is kind of wide as a long term play. But this pen name, because I know how to work the KU system, I just write in the wrong in the wrong genres. But this is going to be in a, in a KU genre, and it's 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 actually designed from the bottom up as as a KU experiment just to see 
what I can do when I write something that's more squarely in the right genres for KU. And um, yeah, like I'd, I'd like to put into practice, like, because I, I, I manage marketing for another author and he's all in with KU. And yeah. I know how to work that system really, really well. Um, but historical fiction and nonfiction, I don't think are great KU genres. Like historical fiction, the readers just simply aren't there. They're yeah. more wide. Uh, well, they're, 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 there's not too many of them wide either. That's another problem. But uh, with the nonfiction, with the how-to books, I find that people want to own them. And that yeah. even when they were selling well and very visible on Amazon, even when they were ranked very high after promotion, they weren't getting any borrows. Yeah. And I talked to a few KU subscribers and they said, no, 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 I, I, I bought that. I don't want to borrow that. I want to be able to refer back to it, which, which makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So because I, I, I know how to work the KU system, but I'm writing in the wrong genres, it made, it made sense to me to try writing in, it, it's, it's science fiction, um, basically. Um, but a particular niche in science fiction that I think is kind of underserved at the moment. And um, I've always read more science fiction than, than historical fiction. I've, I have a few trunked science fiction novels. Like it was always on the plan to write some at some point. Mm -hmm. um, so it made sense now to, because like while I do have a list and I do have a platform, none of those people are there to read science fiction by me. Right. So it, it, it's not really starting from zero. I'd be starting from zero anyway if I put it out under my regular name and possibly from a minus, given that the algorithms already think I write totally different kind of books. So right. start fresh, go into KU, see what happens. Are you uh, planning to like, sort of like with the, the uh, advertising your fiction to your writing crowd, are you going to come out later to your platform and say, by the way, six months ago, I published sci-fi if you're interested? Yeah, that, 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 that's the general plan. Unless it totally bombs, and then I will never own up. <laughs> you know, if it has a 1.4 average or something on Amazon and it only sells 10 copies, I'd be, yeah. I'd be walking away from that and, you know, like filing down the license plates and everything, you know, <laughs> throwing the dog tags into the river. Just forget about it. Um, yeah, yeah. But no, the plan is it's, it's not going to be a big secret or anything, you know. I'm, I, I, um, it's not like, you know, uh, reverse, reverse harem or anything. Uh, I'm, I'm totally going to be owning up to it. Um, but at the start, I do want to protect this also bot, so I won't, I won't be disclosing um, to either side uh, what I'm doing until, until those are hopefully firmly attached after a couple of months. That's really smart. I, I, I find that difficult uh, just because I'm, you know, I, I've written under my own name my whole life. And uh, there's this tendency to like, once I've got that book ready to go, I, I want to push it out to the world. So I, I admire your your personal strength. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, like you know, like I'm, I won't be doing like kind of any kind of black ops operation to keep it secret. Like I will be telling like privately some friends and stuff, and it may leak out, but it's no big deal. It's not like you know, like I'm a I, I, I'm a preacher who's writing erotica on the side, and it's going to you know totally destroy my life if anyone finds yeah. that out, finds out. Um, but you know, I have my I have my pen name picked out, have my titles, have. Uh, I'm talking to a cover artist already. I have my domain. I have my domain name. I, that's when I really got committed. When I bought the domain name and put down my my sixteen dollars or whatever it was, uh, <laughs> and that's when I felt okay. There's no there's no turning back now. I'm doing this, and it's fun. It's exciting, you know. Yeah, and I, I I've I've talked I've talked about this before. Like I've actually considered because I you know I wrote I switched genres. I, mean, I wrote sci-fi and fantasy for the first part of my career, and then switched to thrillers. Um, and I, I love it, but there's always these other stories in my head. And I've talked about maybe launching another pin name and, you know, kind of, and I, if I did that, my feeling is I would start with the advantages of, um, I actually know how to build this now, you know, um, I mean, I have the platform already, but at least I would know the structure of the thing. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Yeah, like you're 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 starting fresh, but like you know you have connections and experience, and you know how everything works. You know how the algorithms work. You know which ad sites are worth your money and which aren't. Um, you know so and 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 if it's not a big secret pen name, like it's like if you've got a connect at a retailer or whatever, it's, you can be totally upfront. I'm writing under this name. You know, it's not yeah. a big deal. Um, yeah. But I think you know there is there, there, I don't know like there, there's a few theories out there that 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 the algorithms favor new names and new books. I don't know how much there is to that, but um, hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll find out pretty soon yeah. um, if, if there is anything to that. But I, I, I do definitely think that um, 
when I when I launch a historical novel, that it, it counts against me, um, that I have all this history of selling books in a different genre, and um, yeah. like even even if it's not visible on your also box, I think it actually affects both sides. I think it just any element of confusion means that um, it's it's possible that the algorithm or that the Amazon system will start recommending your book to the wrong readers, or if it's just not getting a clean read on 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 what kind of book it is, it, there's a danger there. I think so. I talked to a couple of uh, a couple of writers who are uh, relaunching under pen names uh, because they did they did switch genres, um, and uh, one of one in particular was uh, he's basically putting himself as a co-author. What do you think of that strategy? Yeah, like that's that that's possible, but I I would worry there that that the algorithms will 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 import some of your some of your history there or will yeah. will link link you in the system. Maybe it's safer to do that after a couple of months, once once the uh, system has gotten a read on the book and who it wants to recommend it to. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, it might be safer to go under the first name first, but I don't know. Like you know, you only really find out by 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 trying things. Um, that's true. Like I'm, well, I'm, I'm at the try I'm, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like one of the one of the things I'm because like I'm not I'm not walking away from historical fiction. I've just I've just started a. a five or six book series and I've only got one of them out and um, I've the whole thing plotted out and I've got the second one started and, and all that. Um, I just wanted to do something a bit kind of fun and different before I got into the really heavy, serious historical research again. Um, but yeah, like if this experiment works or just, I'll, I'll be able to judge it just looking at how the book moves and, and the algorithms and stuff, but I might rebrand my fiction under a slightly different name, put throw in an initial there or a shortened version of my name or use my middle name or something. Um, I might do something like that. Um, I, I'm still thinking about it because I don't know. There's some I have some internal block about doing that that I want my real name on those books, you know. I'm the same way, man. But I might, I might, I might just have to get over that. If uh, there's no point having your real name on them if they're if they're going to be invisible to people, you know. And That's like, true. Yeah. And the last, like the last historical novel I, I released, um, it should have it it should have done a lot better than it did. Like it. It was it was much better written than the first two. I had a bigger mailing list. I had a better promotional plan. I had more juice to throw at the launch, and it and it sold. It was actually my lowest seller, and and that was at the point where I was like, okay, I've got to do something here, you know, because the books are getting better, the marketing spend is getting bigger, my platform is bigger, and the, and the sales are getting smaller. You know, something's not adding up here. Yeah. Um, like there was a few technical problems around the launch where like it didn't get also bought for for three months, which you know that really killed it. But there was other things, I can't just blame that, you know, there was other things going on too, like, like my mailing list was getting less responsive, you know, my opens were, were falling, my click rates were falling, um, because I was mistreating my, my mailing list of subscribers. So that's another thing I've been tackling over the last six months or so, I've kind of revamped my whole approach to email. So yeah. like I've kind of been looking at all the different parts of my career and what's working and what's not. And doubling down on the stuff that's working and trying to refurbish all the stuff that's not working like like my website was was was, was terrible and now now it's going to be great yeah um, i wasn't so hot on on facebook ads like a year or two ago i was a bit slow to get on them but now i have them rolling pretty well and um, i didn't know anything about book club ads but now um i found all sorts of tricks to get to get book club ads working AMS is the last one now I have to crack. Like that's 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 the current project. I can't, I just can't seem to get my head around AMS at all. But yeah. like, like there's so many things that I think we can often find it overwhelming. Like, um, especially if you're you're starting out, or if you were like me where you got lazy for a couple of years mm. and kind of let let the grass grow a little bit. It can get overwhelming when you you see just five or six things that are all incredibly complex that you have to wrap your head around. But just take them one by one. You know, I didn't I didn't do everything at once. Um, I just took it one at a time, you know, yeah. first I got better at email and then, you know, then I got better at Facebook ads and you just, just do it one by one and then it's manageable. Anybody can do it. Yeah. That's the, that's the way I've been looking at it too. Cause I got for a while there, man, I was trying to do all of it. Uh, and it, it was exhausting and stressful and, uh, it, it, you know, there was a point at which I'm like, is this even worth doing anymore? Uh, you and I talked in the, the lost interview uh, <laughs> about that idea, yeah. of sort of, you know, personal marketing, you know, uh, uh, getting back to having personal relationships with our, our readers and through that reading that mailing list and that sort of thing. Is that kind of what you're talking about? 
Yeah, like um, I, I did this amazing course um, last December, Tammy Lebrecht's course, and it really changed my whole approach to email. Like I didn't, like I knew I had issues with my approach to email going in, but I wasn't really prepared to have my whole approach, like complete, like to go against everything I always thought and said, like, like I, I, I was skeptical about some aspects of it going into the class, but like what I used to do was, for example, I only emailed people when I had a new release. Mm -hmm. um, I, I thought I was being considerate. I didn't want to clog up their inboxes. I figured everyone was like me, they're drowning in email and they didn't want, you know, yet another, you know, weekly message that they didn't care about. So I, I thought I was being cool and considerate and saying, hey, look, I'll, I'll only email you when I have a new book. I won't bother you otherwise. But, yeah. you know, combine that with someone who was like my, my production schedule um, for a variety of reasons slowed down and I was releasing books a lot slower. And that's a killer. When if you're only emailing people when you have a new book and then you're not producing new books, then, you yeah. know, they're, they're not getting any emails at all and they forget about, they forget who you are pretty quickly. But right. even that strategy, I don't think is, is optimal. Now that I've seen the other way to do it, I don't think it's optimal even if you're releasing very quickly. Um, like the transformation since I switched, because I switched my, my nonfiction side, I switched to a weekly newsletter now. And I mm -hmm. email people just free tips every Friday, um, usually with a marketing focus, something on, on reaching readers and building audience, whether it's how to do book bub ads or um, different hacks to get into extra Amazon categories or whatever. I send something out every Friday. And, you know, it's not like one of these expertly tailored um, emails where they're telling you a story and at the end it comes the punchline with the handout or, you know, some kind of bait and switch where there's a sale at the end or a link to a paid webinar or, or one of those things. I'm just giving every week, just giving. Here's, here's, here's a little piece of information or a tool or something you can use to build your business. And I'm not monetizing it with affiliate relationships. I'm not, um, there's not some ultimate sell down the road where there's going to be some pivot to a thousand dollar course or something like that. That's not the idea. The idea is just to build up, you know, like a, like, a bank of karma or something like where you're if you're because on my old approach when i was just emailing people telling them i had a new release that was just chaining a string of asks together because yeah. even when you're saying hey i've got a new release that's an ask and i didn't realize i thought it was a give mm -hmm. it's not it's an ask you're asking for their money um, and so that's the only time they ever heard from me is when i turned up their house looking for money and that's yeah. the kind of relationship i have with my readers which is which is not good um but now I'm giving them something every week. And then, you know, on the odd time, every couple of months or whatever, when I say, oh, hey, I could do with some reviews on this book, or hey, I've got a new book you might like to check out, or hey, here's a book a friend of mine wrote that I think you'll find useful. Yeah. The response then is a lot better. And like, I've seen it straight away. Like, like my mailing list is, is much, much bigger now. It's much more responsive. The open rates have jumped up, the click rates. But also I'm getting emails back from people every week saying, hey, I really love your emails. So I was like, I never got this before, you know. Yeah, yeah. Say they, they're enjoying them or find them useful or, or entertaining or whatever. And I actually feel like I have a connection with my readers that I never really, well, I felt it to a certain extent with my blog, but there's something a bit more personal, a bit more intimate about email. Um, mm. Especially if you write it that way, I think you should always write, like I, when you're writing a blog, you're talking to an audience. It's like standing up in front of a room of people. But when you're writing an email, I think it's always more effective if you imagine you're writing just to one person. Right. And, but, but it really does feel like that. And, you know, someone will email back and say, oh, thank you for this tip. It really helped me with this. And sometimes they give me a tip and that helps me with my own career. Or um, sometimes, you know, just talking out a problem with someone, when, if they say they can't get into a certain category on Amazon and my tip didn't work for them, and we run down the issues. And then I get a deeper understanding of it. And I think, like, it's, it's both sides are actually getting more out of the relationship now. Not just in terms of, oh, hey, this is helping me sell more books. It's actually right. like, it, just in, in terms of like emotional impact on me personally, it, it's great. Like, like getting, getting these emails back from people every week, telling me they're enjoying the emails. Like I get, I get a real buzz out of that. Yeah, yeah, that's in, that's exactly the experience I've had. Um, and I, you know, we and I, you and I talked, have talked about this before, but I started um, really getting personal uh, and one, once a week, and I don't think this is too frequently actually, or too frequent, uh, but once a week, you know, I reach out to my, my readers in my mailing list and just fill them in on some things, uh, you know, and I give them little tidbits of, you know, this week I did some research on this that's going into the next book, or I, 
I just tell them uh, I'm moving or I'm, you know, just set up my new office or something like that. And I make it very personal. And the response has been fantastic. What I, I get more opens, I get more click through when I do include a link. Uh, it's just overall people care about you more. So they want to help you out more. And I think that's a great way to market your work. Yeah. Well, they, they, they feel, they feel more a part of it. And, and right. it's not, well, I, I guess you could do that in kind of like a, a, a slimy way. And I guess there are some like kind of uh, internet marketers out there who try and ape that, that kind of personal connection. Yeah, But you can, but, you but, can tell but, though. You yeah. Can you can always, I, I, yeah, you can tell, you can tell it, you can feel the difference. But I think when there is that personal connection, like, like they do feel part of it because they are part of it. Like, like I've been doing this series on, on, on book club ads um, with my mailing list on and off over the last couple of months. Like I'll do, I'll do an episode of it every, every two or three weeks. I'll, I'll do another one on book club ads. And like, I, I didn't realize that, you know, first of all, I'm kind of stealth writing a book here, which is a great way to trick my conscience into like, oh, I've just got to do my Friday email. And then I end up writing, you know, a thousand, sometimes 2000 words. Like my, my weekly emails are long. Yeah. Um, but now I've got about 15, 20,000 words in the bank on, on a book of ads book that I didn't even realize I was writing. And then like when I release it, like I'm, I'm sure the people who have been enjoying those, those episodes, We'll probably still buy it again anyway, especially if I don't launch it too expensive. But they'll certainly mm -hmm. review it and stuff. And I, you know, like we'll, we'll all get something out of it. Like I, I think when you see something being made, it's more special to you. You know, even if it's yeah. just some guy whittling a boat or whatever. You know, you do feel part of it, even if you're just watching it. But especially if you're participating. And I've been like, and people have been sending me in examples of of ads they like, and and they've been asking me questions about their targeting or why isn't this working, or somebody showing me an ad that's getting really good CTR. So they are actually participating in the making of a book in, 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 in quite a direct way in, in some ways. And yeah. I think all of that, all of that does help. Like, it, and it really helped me. And I, I realize now that I'm getting back to what actually made me kind of successful the first time around when I first released the first edition of Let's Get Digital in 2011 and it kind of exploded and like totally accidentally took my career down a way different path. Um, and it was, I was doing this in my blog, I was I was posting each week about how to find an editor, how to find a cover designer, um, how to market your book, how to run a competition on Twitter, and and things like that. And and people were posting in the comments, and I was just learning all this stuff at the time. And like I would find an editor, and then the next week I would, or the next day I would say, hey, I just this is how you find an editor. I learned this yesterday, kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You could get away with that a bit more in 2011. But people are in the comments, and they were they were going through these steps at the same time. They were trying to find an editor. They were trying to figure out how to format a book. So we we're all kind of solving the problems together. And then when I actually released the book, I mean, actually they told me to put it all into a book. Like I, I don't think I was planning to turn it into a book. And, and one of them just said, can you put it in a PDF so we can download it and print it out while we're publishing our own book? So I was like, yeah. oh, okay. And then I started assembling it. And then it was like, oh, well, you know, if I'm going to do this, I, I better do it properly and write a bit more text on that chapter and whatever and it and it turned into a book and then as soon as i released it it just took off like crazy yeah. and i think a big part of that was because i they were acting like a live beta audience and then when it came out they all bought it even though they'd read it all already in in, in some sense but they all promoted it too like it, it was like a secret army of people out there pushing the book because they all felt uh because they, they, they were because they were part of ownership yeah. yeah 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 so that's exactly it's, it's, what um, it's, 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 yeah, Andy Weir did that with fiction, you know. Right. Um, so I, I can't imagine it wouldn't work. When I actually think it might work better uh, with nonfiction just because, you know, these folks also have their own platforms. So that, you know, that, that buy it to support you thing is great. But, you know, the fact that they would go on and push it to their fellow writers and, uh, and get it out there for you is kind of, you know, that's just interesting. I mean, that's a, that's a, I love that plan. <laughs> yeah, I, I think sometimes, like, even though, even though I know how, like, the Amazon system works, and I know yeah. that we're in a model of abundance now, I think sometimes we can still get caught in a scarcity mindset, um, which is what, what, what's killing traditional publishers still, yeah. you know, they, they, they still look at it in a zero-sum way. But I think even, even though we know that's wrong, we can still, I think it's so baked into us um, that we can still fall into that trap again. Like I remember when when Guy Kawasaki released that self-publishing guide that sold like crazy. That yeah. author, publisher, entrepreneur, 
like he had an open beta group on Google Plus with like 2,000 people in it. And he just gave them all a free copy of the early draft of the book and they all did beta corrections and everything. And that was a huge part when he was talking about why that book was so successful. Obviously he had a big platform and everything already, but they became like a promotional army for him. And they went out and promoted the book. Not only did they buy it, even though they already had a free copy, they all bought it, they all reviewed it, they all promoted it to everyone because they felt a part of that book because they, they were involved in it. You know, they, they, they did contribute feedback on, on a beta version. And I don't know how I got away from that um, after accidentally, you know, falling into such a great system. Somehow I got away from that. But now I feel like via email, I'm kind of getting, getting back into that relationship with my readers again. I think it's even better... Um to do that via email than say on a blog though. Um, because you're, you're the people who are interacting with you on email, they're not just casual observers who dropped in from out of the blue. These are people who are more or less vetted, right? Like they're, they're, they're in it because they want to hear from you. They're, they, they came to the table. Um, and they, they basically paid by giving you their, their contact information. Whereas someone just casually dropping by on a blog, post, you know, could be any random person who may not be the target audience uh, in the end. So yeah, that's and, my it, theory. And, it, and it often is, you know, like, like I've been, I've been blogging a lot about like kind of various scams and stuff going on. So there, there's, there's, I don't know what percentage of, of, of my blog subscribers would be people kind of waiting to see if they get mentioned in a certain, in a certain context. But certainly if I ever talk about you know, the topic of, of scamming or stuffing or any, any of the, any of the, the kind of cheats that are going on in, in KU at the moment. There's also always a cohort that comes along in, into the comments. And I, I think that kind of blocked me up a little bit where, you know, I didn't feel like um, talking about certain topics or I, sometimes I just wouldn't feel like blogging. It's so like, oh, I don't want to deal with those people or I don't want to throw out a morsel for the audience like when, yeah. when those, those people might benefit. But then I feel like, you know, with my with my mailing list like that, that that's my crew they're my people and i feel very comfortable sharing much more um with them than i do these days with the blog and that's probably all in my head but you know i have to live uh, with this head of mine it's firmly attached <laughs> on my body um and so you know it's working for me i'm not gonna i'm not gonna question it too much i'm i do want to get the the, the blog ramped up again now that um moved everything over to a new site but i mean do you I'm, still see value in in blogs though do you still see it yeah i do like like there's like i've had blog posts which have gone which have gone viral and you know yeah. you, that's that's not going to happen with an email so yeah i don't know maybe i need to figure out what kind of content i want to put where but certainly if there's a message where i want it to go to the widest possible audience the blog is usually the best bet for that um, mm -hmm. But if it's something like if I'm doing a series on book bub ads that I might ultimately turn into a book, that feels like a much more natural fit for a kind of a, a semi-private audience like like an email audience. I'll, I'll, I'll figure out eventually what, which, which content is going to go in which channel. But um, yeah, that seems like a, a kind of a good split at the moment. The blog for, for, for campaigning and for like kind of public stuff and, and, and the email for private figuring out marketing experiment kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Yeah. I, I've more or less walked away from um, routinely blogging on my site. I blogged for draft to digital, uh, which, you know, the audience is very specific there. It's very clear, a very clear distinction. Uh, but, you know, I was blogging for my readers for a while. And in, and in fact, if I, when I was doing the, I did like a whole short story a day experiment and that was phenomenal. Uh, engagement was huge. Uh, but it's really difficult to maintain. And uh, I don't know if I, I don't know if I want to continue that or not, but it is something that the readers really love. So maybe I should rethink it. Short, short, <laughs> short story a day. That, that'll probably punch a little hole in your schedule. Yeah, a little bit, but I, you know, it was a, it was a challenge. I do stupid idiotic challenges like that every now and then write a book in a day, write a, you know, blog post or a, a short story a day. I do that. I do. I, I'm a glutton for punishment. Um, all right, man. Well, look, we, we're at, we're at the end. I don't want to take up much more of your time, um, but I, I I'm so glad that you agreed to come back. Um, I always love hanging out with you, man. I know we're. Are you going to be at Nink again this year? Definitely, definitely. definitely. Yeah, you know, jo Joanna Penn wrote me and said she's going to be there this year too. 
Yeah, I heard. You can hang out with her. Yeah, it's going to be fun. She's a lot of fun. You know, we do the karaoke thing, and she gets into the karaoke thing. Uh, <laughs> and last year, you did – I know you sang Valerie at least once. I did. I sang Valerie, and then I sang another song, which we won't mention because uh, it wasn't quite up, quite up, quite up to your standards. It doesn't have to. It doesn't. Well, have I blame. To, I blame the arrangement. It was the arrangement threw me off completely. Yeah, yeah. Well, they they threw me off too, man. He, he one of the songs I did. He it's like in a a key like three octaves higher than what I can what most humans can produce. Uh, but anyway, it'll be good to hang out. We'll we'll have a blast. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can get security calls. To, uh, to, one, to, more time. one more time <laughs> uh yeah man i consider that one of our finer moments um all right <laughs> where can people find you and your work i know you're splitting these up now so now now we got two directions to send folks where can people find you and your work online well if you just if you just google my name david gochran um you'll you'll be able to find me easily uh davidgochran.com is the main author website for if you want like there's hundreds of blog articles there about every different aspect of publishing. And you can, you can sign up to my list there, my, my weekly newsletter and get a free copy of Amazon decoded or, or check out my other author books. But if you like historical fiction, you can just go to david um, which will actually redirect into a secret half of my david website, but cool. it's a separate, separate domain. So it's easy to hand out depending on which audience I'm talking to. Yeah. Um, that's and I'm cool. on Facebook and Twitter and all that. Facebook, stuff. Twitter, all the uh, uh, MySpace. <laughs> yeah. You'll find. I think I, think, I have a GeoCities site as well. If you look. Man, I miss GeoCities actually. It was the future for people. A while. Rag on it, but I kind of miss it. Uh, all right. Well, everybody listening, uh, you can find links to everything that uh, David does in the uh, show notes of this episode, of course, and just just Google him. He's very Googleable. Uh, just like me, you Google either one of us, we're all over the place. Uh, but right now, you're probably hearing the groovy bridge music, and you may dance in place at will. Uh, we're going to have some news for you, industry news on the other side of the break. Uh, but otherwise, David, man, thanks for being a part of the show, man. I really do appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody. Thank you for sticking around, and we'll see you on the other side. Hey, you stuck around? I'm glad to see you here. Now, I'm going to jump right into the industry news because there's some, some cool stuff you're just going to want to hear about. And I hope you enjoyed that interview with David Gockring. Great guy. Make sure you're tracking him, following him online. But for now, let's get to the industry news. And, of course, the industry news is brought to you by draft to digital where you can convert your manuscript, publish it online, and get support the whole way, go check out drafttodigital.com slash wordslinger, and that's where you'll uh, you'll actually give me a little kickback when you do that. But you can hop on in. Everything they do is free. They take a tiny little 15% cut of your royalty when you make a sale, so they only make money when you make money. That's the best kind of business deal. So thanks for that. Uh, this is also brought to you by a little something I've put together called Written World Tees, and that's where you can find t-shirts uh, with stuff I've written on them. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a bit, but uh, you can check out Written World. Uh, you can check out bit.ly slash written world dash tees, and you'll find some cool designs you may like. So let's hop right into the news. Uh, traditional ebooks are down. Indie, uh, indies are up. <laughs> I may have stumbled a little bit on the headline, but uh, that's according to a story from GeekWire, which presents the oddly confusing yet comforting statement that ebook sales are dying. Ebook sales are insanely popular. Uh, the story cites PubTrack Digital's research results showing a 10% decline in ebook sales from 2017 over 2016. Uh, the 450 publishers included in the study saw ebook sales from 170 million units to 162 million in that one year span. Uh, a second study released by the American Association of Publishers seems to jive with those results, um, showing a 4.7% drop in ebook sales in 2017 from more than 1,200 publishers. Uh, but not all is lost because indie book sales are actually on the rise. Um, if you factor in indie publishing, you get a revolution of ebook sales. Big numbers are hitting the board, including. One from Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, who says, and I quote, over a thousand independent authors surpassed one hundred thousand dollars in royalties in 2017 through the Kindle Direct Publishing pro, uh, platform. 
That's just Kindle Direct. I also have a little inside news that at least 13 authors in the draft to digital uh, platform are making that much and more. And uh, there's a range of authors uh, below $100,000 that are still making a pretty good living as an independent publisher. That's ebook sales um, and ebook sales only. So that opens up a, an interesting idea about where the publishing industry is going. We keep hearing uh, horror stories and seeing numbers that support the idea that ebooks are on the decline, that sales are down. And I would argue that when, uh, as actually uh, Kat Rambo uh, would argue in this very article, uh, that when you see an ebook price twice the price of a paperback book, um, there's something wrong there. <laughs> You might be able to justify uh, the ebook sales going down when uh, ebooks are actually costing more than their print equivalents, and yet have almost no overhead, uh, very little overhead to uh, making sure that ebooks are out there available for the public to sell. So, uh, margins are great on ebooks. Trust me on this, man. I work in the industry. Margins are great on ebooks. There's no reason for them to be priced so high in comparison to print, unless your goal is to drive down ebook sales. And that's the reality of that. So what's happening is the indie industry is publishing and uh, moving in and taking all those readers that are being left out in the cold by the traditional publishing industry. So where is that going to go to? I could give you some slippery slope uh, answers to that, but my uh, where I stand on it is I think that indie publishing is going to become the norm. We're going to have a uh, an evolved hybrid publishing model, and from there, uh, who knows what happens. So that's the state of the industry right now. Um, it, let me know what you think about this story. Hop into the comments below this episode, and uh, of course, you can find in the show notes of this episode, you'll find a link to this story, and that will be bit.ly slash 151-ebooks. Uh, and by the way, uh, Roland Denzel, if you're listening, I hear you. You don't like the uh, bit.ly links. We're going to work on that. So <laughs> next story up is, uh, should we judge an author by, or should we judge a work by its author ra rather? Uh, now this comes in the wake of allegations of sexist misconduct um, f uh, f with author Juno Diaz. Uh, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning author who was accused of forcibly kissing a woman Earlier, uh, earlier this year, actually, he was accused of for forcibly kissing her when she was in her 20s. Uh, I don't actually know when the accusation was made or when this event happened, um, but it, it sort of opened up a, uh, an interesting question. In a recent editorial in the National Review, the writer is asking, should we judge a work by the person who created it? Um, now, this is, a, this is hot and topical, actually, in the wake of things like Bill Cosby being uh, convicted on rape charges. Uh, when we look back at, an, at a creator's work, are we to judge the work based on the life and the uh, behavior and the activities of that writer? And I don't think we should. I think we actually should separate the two. And so does this writer, by the way. Um, I think we should be looking at these as two separate things. The, a, we are capable as, as human beings of creating things that actually rise above our own nature. Um, that's kind of the point, right? And it, it's part of our exploration and growth and, and evolution as human beings. So uh, we can have people who are completely reprehensible. And I'm not saying that, uh, that uh, Mr. Diaz is. Is reprehensible. I, I, he's only been accused, as far as I know, and not convicted. And we're not going to convict him here either. But uh, I don't know what his personality is like. But I do know that enough people resonated with his work that he won a Pulitzer Prize for it. Uh, and that does lend some social credibility to it, and that means that there is some sort of intrinsic, you know, human worth to that work. Uh, can we separate the uh, work from its author? I hope we can, because uh, if we can't, then we're also saying that human beings are incapable of change and incapable of growth beyond their mistakes. I don't believe that. If you believe that, I think we, we, we've got a conflict. <laughs> so let me know what you think of this. Uh, check out the story. You can go to uh, bit.ly slash 151 dash bad writer, uh, which is kind of a gag on my part, and I'm sorry. I don't mean to imply that he, that uh, Mr. Diaz is actually a bad writer, uh, but uh, go check out the story and uh, get back to me. Leave a comment in the uh, comments below. Um, I hope that we can uh, kind of figure this out because honestly, there's a great... Let's just bring Bill Cosby back into it for a second. The Cosby Show helped shape 
in a positive way a lot of American lives, including lives of African Americans who uh, may or may not have ever considered things like being able to go to college, build a, a life for themselves, um, you know, have uh, a nice home and live in nice neighborhoods. There were a lot of African Americans who uh, came out afterwards and said that that show influenced them in that way. That's a positive thing. So are we going to try to take that away from culture because of the behavior and the, uh, the reprehensible behavior of Bill Cosby? It's a tough question to answer. Actually, it's not a tough question to answer. I'm just going to flat out answer it and say we shouldn't. We should be able to separate the two. Uh, the actor, the, the actor comedian is not the work he produced. We could judge both on their own merits. Uh, and I also happen to believe that uh, regardless of any mistakes we've made in the past, we can, uh, we can evolve and change from those. I don't believe that anybody should be completely defined by the mistakes they made in the past. Everyone ha deserves the opportunity to, uh, to make up for their own mistakes and uh, live a better life and be a better person. So that's my opinion. You let me know your opinion in the comments below. I don't want to start a whole heated debate about it, but uh, I understand there's going to be some pretty strong opinions on one side or the other of this, and these are just mine. These are just completely mine, which means they can be ignored at will. Uh, next and final story, uh, what can algorithms tell you about your writing? Now, that's the exact title from the Wall Street Journal uh, post that is uh, exploring the idea of algorithms helping with editing. They're actually, they're actually saying the, uh, algorithms could be your next editor. Um, now, we've already had some experience with this. The Flesh Kincaid score for uh, writing readability uh, uh, grade level and that sort of thing has been around for a long time. But this has improved com and become more and more complex over time. And now we've got this scenario where uh, technology can actually determine everything from not just the grade level, but the mood of the writing, the complexity of the ideas. You can get into some pretty heady stuff with this. Um, so it kind of opens the idea of using this technology as your next editor for your next book. Um, now, I personally don't think we're at a point where artificial intelligence is going to be able to uh, 100 percent of the time compensate and uh, you know help us out, <laughs> help us find themes and that sort of thing. But I could be wrong. After watching the uh, demo of Google Duplex, man, I'm not sure. I mean, we're passing the Turing test now, so uh, who knows? Um, but. My personal take is that we're still not quite there, but I do think that the technology is developed enough that it might actually be a great aid. Uh, it might help authors, especially those who are just sort of learning their craft, uh, and it could uh, reduce overhead. Uh, this can actually help reduce your budget somewhat because uh, you can use this technology to help it do one or two passes of your work before handing it on to another editor or an editing team. Uh, that's how I would use it. Uh, I'm, I'm not comfortable just relying on it altogether because I don't think that it could tell the difference. Uh, for example, if I intentionally wanted my writing to uh, reflect poor grammar or something along those lines. Will, is it at that level? I'm not sure yet, but you can actually go and test some of your own work on this uh, article. They've got a little drop-in box. You can paste some stuff in there. Check this out. It's bit.ly slash 151-algorithm, and you'll find a link to that in the show notes below. Let me know what you think. What's the what's your feeling about this? Uh, you know, Pop into the comments and tell me what you think about our uh, robot overlords editing our work. <laughs> and possibly writing our work. If they can edit, then they can write. So... Uh, maybe we're uh, building ourselves out of uh, some careers here. Who knows? Uh, thanks so much for checking that out. Are you looking for some cool t-shirts with which to hide your naked shame? I can help you out with that. I just opened up the uh, wor the Written World Tees, uh, and that's where you can go find a bunch of shirts and other items, all kinds of cool stuff, really, all with uh, words written by me. So go check that out. You'll find that at bit.ly slash written world dash tees, and uh, you'll find a link to that, of course, in the uh, show notes below. Go! Go try something on. They're not that expensive. They're kind of cool. And I'd love to hear what you think of them. You can pop into the comments here 
or uh, go to wordslingerpodcast.com and hit the contact button. Let me know what you think. So that is it for this week's Wordslinger Podcast. I hope you got something out of this great interview with David Gochran. I hope you got something out of these news stories. Let me know what you're getting out of the show. Let me know what you're uh, picking up. I hope you're enjoying all of it. And, of course, if you want to support me and my work, subscribe to the show. Hit the uh, little notification icon. Uh, Heck, hit it twice. Let them know you want to hear from me every time a new episode goes up. And uh, you can also support me. This is my favorite way. Go to kevintomlinson.com slash books. And that will let you uh, pick up any of my books, anything that's available online uh, right now. And uh, that, that helps everybody. That helps me. That helps you. You get, you get some entertainment. I get a couple of bucks out of it. Uh, everybody's happy. So thank you so much for that. Thank you for being a part of the Word Slinger podcast. Enjoy your weekend ahead. God bless each and every one of you. And I'll see you all next time. <laughs>